Welcome to Real Ag Live, everybody. I'm your host, Sean Haney. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Hope you're having yourself a great day and making Real Ag Live a part of your midday portion of that day. We've got a great guest today. We'll be talking to Arlen Suderman. We're going to bring him in here in a second. If you do have a question for Arlen, you know, his, his knowledge is extensive, uh, whether it's ec- economics, geopolitics, as it all applies to what's happening in the commodity markets. It's been a real challenging time here through, through COVID-19. And we're not through it yet. Uh, I wouldn't say we're on the backside of it, uh, but we at least we've been in it for a number of months and we can maybe try to provide some clarity today on what it means for the grains and the livestock market. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. If you do have a question, make sure you ask it in the comment box, whether you're watching on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. All you got to do is type it in. I'll see it on my screen and I'll get the questions as many as we can over to Arlen. Let's uh, bring in Arlen here. Uh, There we go. Arlen, how are you doing? Yeah, it's great to chat with you. So Arlen is the chief commodities economist with Stone X based out of Kansas City. Uh, And Arlen, you are lucky Kansas City. You do have Patrick Mahomes as a Bears fan. I am super jealous. I I will say that uh, because the Bears could have picked Mahomes in that draft and instead instead took Mitch Trubisky. Yeah, that's uh, not good. That's kind of like being short tech stocks right now. Um, Arlen, talk about StoneX. uh, Before we get to some of the markets, what does StoneX do? all in trying to help uh, customers manage their risk exposure now it takes it looks differently in different parts of the world here in in north america for example in the united states our clientele are primarily uh, commercial based in canada it's more farmer based although we're expanding more farmer based in the united states now Um, in south america it's more farmer based Um, but throughout it's all about helping service customers, helping them manage their risk exposure, uh, and working with them, really being customer-based. What are your needs? Help us understand your needs. And then we figure if you're successful, then we'll be successful. So we put your success first. I was hired in 2015, October of 2015, because we were, we were expanding and growing so fast. Uh, that we needed a market intelligence department in North America uh, to really uh, lead a team, develop a team to do fundamental analysis so that our consult- risk consultants and our customers had a, a grasp of, of what the real upside and downside potential were from a fundamental standpoint. And I started uh, hiring my team. But you know, the company has doubled in size since I came on board less than five years ago. So it's been tremendous growth, and, and we're in all sectors of the world right now with boots on the ground. Okay, so let's jump into the markets, Arlen. Um, you know, we can't go very far in the meat markets or the grain markets without talking about China. Um, yeah. In some ways, they're like the ideal customer. So much demand, a growing middle class, so much opportunity for us as exporters, the U.S. and in Canada. But man, it, it, it has been difficult to do business with them. Is this, is this, is this kind of something that sets in for the long term? It, it is. And let's keep in mind that uh, the Communist Party of China uh, is, has different objectives than what we do in the United States or Canada. And uh, they have very strong stated goals of, num- num- of wanting to be number one economically in the world and number one militarily in the world. They see those two as closely intertwined. You can't have one without the other. And the U.S. is obviously its biggest foe from that standpoint. The United States is the biggest economy in the world. So it's China's objective to take over that number one spot. It bought commodities from us because it needed to, but it was slowly moving and diversifying to other countries, uh, which is good for Canada, Australia, Brazil, et cetera. Um, But becoming dependent upon China also has its price to pay because China doesn't want to be dependent on any country. We'll try to make you dependent upon them and then start to manipulate you to do business the way they want you to do business to serve their needs. 
And so it uh, was natural that the United States and China would eventually get to a point of conflict. That has happened. The question is, where does that go from here? From a historical perspective, any time through history you've had two world superpowers that got to this point, there was a war to settle it. Kind of the big exception was when the uh, former Soviet Union was broken apart and crumbled, and that was largely a, a battle fought between the United States and the West and the former Soviet Union without ever uh, shooting, firing a gun uh, economically. And so China studied that and took a different approach with its One Belt, One Road initiative to invest in infrastructure in countries around the world that would make those countries dependent upon them, make it very difficult then uh, for the West to try to manipulate it economically and bring it to its demise. So they, they've got a great strategy, but it does create some problems. A lot of people to feed. Uh, they need us but uh, in the West, but also they're trying to wean themselves off as well. And, and the, kind of the weird part as of late has been the worse the relationship seems to get, at least the talking back and forth between yeah. the U.S. and China, the worse that gets the more products they seem to be buying. Is this just a moment in time? Like this is, uh, they're just, they're stocking up. Are they, are they fixing those long-term reserves that they've been depleting because of ASF or stuff like that? Like wh where, where do you, where do you sit? Can you explain this? Yeah, there's a lot involved in there. And I have to give credit to a couple of my Chinese employees who, who have a, a really in-depth understanding of the communist party in China and how it thinks and, and responds to really getting an understanding of them. And they had the hardliners and the reformers. And the reformers really had the upper hand for quite some time. The, the party is made up really of a leadership circle of about 400. Uh, within that is a smaller circle of about uh, 50. And within that, a group of seven. And President Xi Jinping is one of those seven. Um, and for a while, the reformers were, let's get rid of our large reserves. They're really too expensive to maintain. Let's depend on world trade. And then you have to throw in coronavirus. When coronavirus hit China, it really disrupted their supply chains. And they had some shortages. And that really gave the upper hand then to the hardliners who want to maintain those reserves so they're never dependent upon anybody. And so that backdrop, they needed that. From the standpoint of trade, they really didn't want a trade agreement with us. They really, and so they were just playing President Trump, leading him along until the White House, and this is my observation, I can't confirm this, but until the White House allowed it to be leaked that they were considering capital controls. Mm. And if you study the amount of capital that flows between the United States and China, that could really be the death knell to their economy. Suddenly, they wanted to talk about a trade agreement, and that was in September of last year, and by January, we had to phase one agreement. We've done some small capital control measures, but not significant. That gave us the phase one. I never thought we'd get to a phase two, <laughs> and it looks like that ain't going to happen it, now. No, no. But they need to maintain the appearance that they're keeping the phase one trade agreement or doing what they can as long as Trump is in office. Trump's out of office, they figure they can go back to handling our presidents like they always have from both parties. Uh, that's not meant to be a political statement, just an observation and, and being a student of them. Um, but that's the way they see things right now, I think. But as long as he's in office, they have to give the appearance that they are trying to live up the agreement. Not that they've ever lived up any trade agreement in the past at, at any time. Yeah, essentially, in some ways, phase one is like the largest grain contract ever negotiated. Now, there, there is some other things that are in there, but all of the focus is on phase one. We were led to believe that you know phase two negotiations would begin right away. I, I was kind of like you, kind of skeptical on that, and here, and here we are. Yeah, in phase two, negotiations probably would have started right away had it not been for coronavirus. Okay, fair. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'm not saying they would have got an agreement. I was skeptical whether they would ever get that agreement. I thought they were just stringing along and never get to that point. Uh, but coronavirus pretty well killed that. And then the way that China handled the coronavirus really angered U.S. leaders. Um, and that really started the deterioration of the relationship. 
Uh, right now, something that's getting a little bit of attention in the mainstream is the floods in China and the impact that that could have in the back half here of of 2020. What are what are you hearing on that? Because uh, I got a question here just from Nine Inch Colas asking. And recently, China has had to f- uh, had floods on many farms and fields due to flooding. So talk about the flood. Yeah, there's some stuff out there that's misleading, and I, I get asked about this all the time. Some of the material out there indicates that the floods have destroyed all the crop production and that mass famine is coming to China. Uh, That's just not true. The floods are very, very serious. China is a massive country. They're a very large country. So if you look at the area of the floods, it's mostly in central China. That is a, a large concentrated area of rice production and rapeseed. And so at this point, it looks like this year's rapeseed and rice production, that much of it got harvested. There'll probably be some losses, but they have tremendous reserves of rice, about a year and a quarter supply of rice. In fact, they were even offering some rice out of the reserve to feed grain users to try to ease the pressure on the corn market. It could be a problem, depending on what happens here, if the Three Gorges Dam breaks or whatever, that could affect next year's rice production. So that's an ongoing story we got to follow. Corn and soybeans, we're talking about maybe 10 to 15% of the belt really seeing an adverse effect. Probably the bigger adverse effect on corn and soybean production in this year is dryness in the North China Plain, although it looks like over the coming week they're going to get some good rains. So we don't see a lot of negative impact on corn, soybeans, and wheat this year. And on rice and rapeseed, we'll have to watch rice and rapeseed for next year. The Three Gorges Dam is the big one. Three rivers come into that. And that dam now, officials uh, admit, is starting to be deformed. And if that dam gives way, what's been modeled so far by Chinese authorities is that it would be a, a wall of water initially 100 meters high, moving downstream at a little better than 60 miles an hour. So they've evacuated over 44 million people. So it's quite a big deal for them. It's just not impacting crop production the way a lot of the way some reports are indicating. Yeah, and, and so I read. I can't remember who put out the report. It was uh, I think it was on Monday talking about how you know the rebuild of their pork herd. It, it is in the way of that dam. Like if that dam breaks, uh, some of their their rebuilt uh, pork herd is going to be wiped out. Is, is that true? Uh, to some extent. It's not like the whole thing. Most of the pork production had been further north where the feet grain is grown in the North China Plain, etc. But they had been starting to m- migrate some of it further south, which would be involved in that flood plain. Hmm. So it would impact some of it. It's hard to get data on just what portion of it. It would be a minority portion of it. But right now, anything that hurts the meat supply would be huge. Um, and have big implications. So yeah, it, that is a factor. Um, but the human toll, if that dam gives way, that will really rock the Chinese economy. And, and frankly, this is the greatest challenge that the Communist Party has faced in China since they came into power 70 years ago. Um, they faced uh, Hong Kong and all the protests there. They faced the coronavirus. They faced African swine fever. And, and they're still dealing with those issues, and now the floods. And if that dam gives way, huge economic impact on the country as a whole. That could really unsettle the leadership and create some problems there for the Chinese leadership. Question from Lindsay uh, watching on Facebook. Hog markets seem to be recovering much slower than others, especially compared to cattle. What's happening in China with ASF and the hog herd there? Again, data is hard to come by, but as we talk to our people on the ground and kind of put the pieces together, it looks like they are are back to somewhere between 20 and 30 percent below where they were pre-ASF in production. They continue to boast to how they're rebuilding their herd, but when you look at pork prices, they're still just below record high prices. Piglet prices set a new record this week. Um, and and are extremely high. They're really commercializing their operation, which could be expected. The small farmer is being squeezed out. He can't afford to pay that for the piglets. Uh, 
And so it's all being commercialized right now. There's a big black market uh, um, activities going on as well with pigs. African swine fever is still very active, but the only reports you hear of African swine fever are hogs in transport. Because if a farm has African swine fever test positive, then the local government unit has to subsidize paying for those hogs. They don't have the money to do that, so somehow those tests always come back negative. Imagine that. But when pigs are being transported, oh, we don't know where they came from, but we caught them and they're positive. Uh Um, And so when you look at where they're getting these hogs in transport positive, it's really across many areas of the country where they're having problems yet. When you look at the feed demand aspect and the prices, it would suggest we're still down. I think it's closer to 30%. There's some data to say that in some of the regions, they may only be down 20%, um, but they're really actively importing as much as they can right now and uh, still seeing prices just about 5% below record high set last October. Hmm. I, I want to jump over to a different commodity for a second. A lot of growers in Western Canada are staple is spring wheat. Uh, it's paid a lot of bills over the number of years. It's it, it's hard currently a lot of times to get, you know, to be in love with wheat. It has not been the payer of those bills like maybe it was for some of our parents. Uh, w- what is your thought on the spring wheat market? Well, it looks like we're going to have a good crop here in the United States, which will add to your, your crop there. Um, you know, it's still the quality milling wheat market. When you look at U.S. and Canada, it's a, you know, our competition is probably Australia, maybe a little bit of uh, Germany and Argentina, but it's still the quality wheat market. And when you look at wheat in the world, we're full of wheat. We got lots of wheat, but a lot of it is feed quality or lower quality, not the protein wheat that the millers want. So there's always going to be demand for it. Um, but unfortunately, that demand hasn't quite been high enough to pay the bills. And so when that happens in the marketplace, it takes a price to make sure we maintain production. And right now that production is uh, being shifted to the Black Sea. They're learning how to grow higher quality uh, wheat there. They're starting to steal a little bit of that market. It was about uh, 27, 28 years ago uh, when uh, I got a call from Senator Dole's office in a job I was in at the time saying that Boris Yeltsin was coming to uh, Kansas and asked if I would set up a farm for him to visit. And it was about wheat harvest time. And so I found a local farmer and uh, Boris Yeltsin came vis- came calling on that farm. And I remember his comments very clearly. He said, you're growing the wheat that came from my country. Your yields are three times what our yields are we will surpass you and we will become the breadbasket of the world. Uh Uh-oh. And that's exactly what they're doing. They put in the, they put in the investment in the genetics and in the infrastructure. Uh, First, it was just growing for volume. Now they're starting to try to grow for quality as well. And so that's a challenge now for both the United States and Canada is the the Black Sea really sets the pace between Ukraine and uh, Russia in their in their wheat production we still have a quality edge over them um, but they're getting better and better at the quality side as well yeah and you know and it's not too often we get a boris yeltsin story here so i i, I love that that's <laughs> nice i'm sure you've got some others that you can't tell uh but you know when we think about the black sea region and we think about brazil argentina you know we, we had this advantage in north america you know the us has you know has the the river system the infrastructure canada of course has the railway you know good ports um but those countries are coming online with better infrastructure they're here to compete we we can't i, I think on the infrastructure thing in in north america we can't rest on our laurels because the black sea region and, and south america are coming for us They really have. And Brazil and the Black Sea region have both very strategically invested in infrastructure. And here in the United States, any improvement in infrastructure, and and I know we're doing some improvement on locks and dams on the Illinois River this summer, but it took 20, 30 years to get that. And it's just not a priority. Agriculture is becoming such a small part of our political power base right now. Although after last election, you would thought it may have... uh, 
elevated a little bit because the farm vote helped put President Trump in office in the United States. Um, but really, agriculture has taken a smaller and smaller seat. And so when it comes to trade and improving that infrastructure, it's becoming more difficult politically to get those improvements on both sides of the border. You know, through, through COVID, Arlen, whether, you know, when we're talking about grains or livestock, I, I've had a few analysts that I've talked to say, you know, we just can't use the word normal. This is not normal. How has all of this impacted the trading of some of these commodities? Is farmers try to make the right decisions on their farm, right? Because you, you can't ignore it. You've you got to figure out how you know, your best marketing strategy. But how has COVID impacted some of those strategies? Well, it's been most challenging for the livestock sector, obviously. When you have processing plants that shut down, um, no place to take the animals, you've got to immediately make some hard decisions. Um, some um, euthanasia w took place to kill animals. Um, that's heartbreaking to a farmer whose whole livelihood is about giving life. Um, slowing the get rate of gain down, changing rations, trying to slow the rate of gain. That's where the real challenges have been and just trying to make a living. On the grain side, it's been a, a much different type of an animal, so to speak, to deal with. We haven't seen the significant impacts. And really, it's something I didn't mention earlier. The coronavirus has probably worked to our advantage in the grain industry in that in China, they are convinced that they handled coronavirus better than any other country in the world. They truly believe that. And it shut them down. We think we shut down. They shut down, period. And that meant their supply lines got shut down. They had shortages of feed, et cetera. Their ports totally shut down. And in their logic, they think, well, since they handled coronavirus better than anyone else, it's only a matter of time before Brazil and United States and Canada shut down because of coronavirus and we will be unable to import from them. So that, going back to your earlier question, uh. it's one of the reasons that they are front-loading. They front-loaded all their Brazil purchases because they were most worried about Brazil. They got the beans they wanted from Brazil and they shifted to North America to start buying from the United States. And they're very aggressively, much more aggressive than normal buying from us right now. And as soon as their ports have room from the Brazil shipments arriving, they'll start taking shipments from us. That's part of why they're buying the corn and wheat as well. They're building their reserves because they believe that ports are going to be shut down in the rest of the world and they won't be able to. So it's worked to the advantage for now for the U.S. farmer. Yeah, but it, it, it's somewhat concerning because, you know, we were kind of taking this increased demand in these summer months as like, hey, we're going to. We're going to build on what would happen as the traditional trading period, which is in the fall. We're, you know, we're, we're going to get closer than we think we are to the to this uh, to the to the phase one requirements, and that's that may not. We're actually maybe some of that fall activity is moving in here to the summer months, is basically what you're saying. Well, I I think that we'll get closer than what a lot of people thought to the year one targets for phase one. Okay, and if President Trump loses the election in November. Year two is probably out the window. Um, mm -hmm. If he wins the election, they'll have to do something to make it look like they're keeping up with year two as well, because they can't afford to have those capital controls. So um, it is a factor, and uh, politics is playing into it, but they're building their reserves. It's primarily government purchases that go into the reserves. Now, the one commodity they're short on is corn. They're producing 30 million metric tons less corn than what they consume every year. And we've been talking about this in presentations we do for the last couple of years. The day of reckoning is going to be coming, and it looks like it's going to that point now. Uh, President Xi Jinping um, traveled last week to a corn farms to tour cornfields. This week, his vice premier did the same thing. It is to the top of the agenda now in China. They have to do something. They can uh, try to discourage demand. They can try to encourage production. They can they can open up trade. Probably a combination of all those th uh, all three of those things. Although all three have some challenges, okay. um, but it does look like they're going to be making some policy changes here soon, and that will impact world grain markets. Uh, certainly, if you take corn prices up, you affect wheat prices. You affect soybeans, etc. Well, I got news for them. The U.S. has lots of corn to sell them. 
<laughs> and we more do. coming and more coming. I, 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 we, I was hoping you're going to say they are, they need canola because uh, of course in Western Canada, that's, that's is, that is the profitability maker. Uh, what do you, what, how do you feel about the overall oil seed complex? Uh, we're producing too much in the Western Hemisphere compared to what the demand is right now. Um, and specifically, a lot of the canola meal went to their fish industry. And when their skirmish with Canada occurred, uh, and they blocked imports of Canadian canola, they switched that over to soy meal. So they've kind of reopened that door, but still not to the levels that they were got to win that business back and that'll probably be tough sledding because it looks like there's going to be enough soy meal around um, producing soybeans in brazil with their weak currency right now is extremely profitable yeah they're going to see a big increase in area planted this next year and if the weather cooperates we're going to have big western hemisphere soybean supplies and so no matter how much they buy from the united states um, there's going to be that much more South American there to bring the world price down. And that's going to have to be competing. Canola is going to have to compete against that. Um, we talked about South America. We talked about the Black Sea, how that relates to competition with North America. Are, are there, in, in like five years, 10 years, are we going to be talking about some new areas that came online? Like where, where are those next areas that are going to be producing products that compete with us? Or, or is it kind of stop right here with, with uh, Brazil and the Black Sea? Well, the Black Sea still has more ability to uh, increase production through technology and better farming practices. But the real wide open space is Brazil. Mm. Uh, if you look at Brazil and the pasture land that can be converted to farm ground, not counting the rainforest, not getting into the rainforest. I tell our farmers here, it's the equivalent of the Great Plains in the United States from the Canadian border to the Texas Gulf Coast. That is how much area can still be converted to cropland in Brazil without touching the rainforest. Tremendous potential. The biggest thing holding them back right now is a lack of infrastructure, and they're starting to make that investment. Well, you just terrified me there. Way to go. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, so what, okay, so knowing that, how should, how should our industries on both sides of the border be responding? Like, what, what can we do uh, to counter the, those new acreages that could possibly be coming online in, in places like Brazil? Well, kind of the mentality of the farmer, first of all, I, and I grew up on a farm, and I, I love working with the farmers. That's my first heart, and that was one of the reasons I almost didn't take the job at Stonex when offered to me five years ago, because I wanted to stay more with the farmer than the commercial. Um, but he's got a mentality that of, of optimism, and it's always going to get better, and that's what keeps him going through the hard times. And the Canadian farmer is probably better than the U.S. farmer about this, but the Brazilian farmer is profitable because he's not just looking at crop prices, he's looking at currency exchange rates. Yeah. And I know that in the U.S., the U.S. farmer just doesn't do that at all. And a way of implementing that as part of the uh, hedge, risk hedging um, is what currency exchange rate is going to be. That can make a big difference with the volatility we're seeing in currencies in trying to hit a lot of singles. Big commodity booms like what we saw 10, 12 years ago come around every 30, 35 years. In between, we got to hit a lot of singles and doubles, to use baseball terms, since we started playing baseball again. Thank goodness. At least here in the States. Yeah. Um, and not try to hit those home runs. Really learn how to use our risk management uh, approach. Work with a partner. We work with an agronomist. It certainly can pay to work with a risk advisor as well and develop a plan, know what your cost of production is, and work at hitting those singles and just kind of adding to it, adding a dime a bushel here or there when you get opportunities and being a smart business person about it. Unfortunately, there's a study looking at personality types on the farm um, that found when looking at personality type on the farm, it fits well with facing the adversity they face, but it doesn't fit well with marketing. Mm -hmm. Only about 25% of farmers, according to a study done by University of Nebraska, have that mentality that fits well, that that, that uh, 
personality traits that fit well with marketing. But their spouses tend to be much higher than that, like 60% of them, it tends to fit. So maybe that partner is your spouse, but if you hire an agronomist, hiring a risk management consultant may be a good way to fill that need and keep the the marriage sound as well. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, Question here on infrastructure from Lindsay. If U.S. and Canada are falling behind on infrastructure, how do we prioritize that investment to stay competitive? Uh, I I see such similar discussions on both sides of the border. Uh, As ag media, we're talking about, you know, need to up, need to upgrade, need to update, need to, you know, do this, but we're having a hard time getting that investment. How do we change that? You know, I, I served a couple of terms on school board, and that was enough to turn me off on politics. <laughs> and we tend to all be so negative about politics, we don't want to get involved. But we got to be. We've got to be part of the grower associations that lobby our, our lawmakers. Uh, we've got to make that investment in time and in our future. We've got to be involved in those efforts to help educate our lawmakers about the value of agriculture to our economies and what that's going to take to sustain it. It's a tough one. It's a tough task. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, okay, so in the next five to ten years, what do you see as the major opportunities then for North American agriculture? Is it uh, we've been working on? We we got the volume part figured out. Um, you know, we, we've got a, a, a big amount of corn carryover, but you said there is some, obviously, a strong demand possibly going to China. Uh, we've got a big crop in the U.S. If, if the weather conditions work out. Do you have a 180 on the corn crop, or what are you thinking? Uh, I'm at 181.6 right now. Holy! That, that, there's some corn out there. We better have the demand, Arlen. Up 2.2 bushels on the week. Wow. That's right. Um, you know, I, I spoke to the U.S. Grains Council earlier this week. And one of the things I addressed is we got to find other alternatives for ethanol, mm. other uses, industrial uses for ethanol, et cetera. We've got to diversify. And it's not just corn and ethanol, but all of our crops. We've got to be putting money into research, again, through our grower associations, develop these alternative use, alternative markets, because uh, we are producing bulk very well. But where can we get quality in the supply chain? And from a livestock sector, it's time for our livestock sector to wake up on the fake meat. Mm. Um, if you look at the ingredients of fake meat, uh, a lot of people probably wouldn't eat it. Um, but it is a rapidly growing market. And where's the meat industry? They're silent. Um, they're, they do have something to be proud of, the meat industry does. They do have a story. But they're being silent, and they're going to wake up someday and, and realize They've lost a lot of their market share that they're going to have trouble getting back. So it's about, you know, when we farm, we farm because we love the way of life. We don't want to get involved in this messy stuff. But if we want to preserve the way of life as it is, we got to get involved. Yeah, you know, and with a lot of the with the plant proteins, I, I really wish there was more of a focus on where that protein is coming from. It's, it's coming from pulse crops, but I wish there was less filler and more mm-hmm. actual of the crop that, that farmers are growing. I got a question here from Brian, who's in Ontario. Do you think China will ever implement a mandated ethanol blend? It was rumored a few years ago. No, it's off. It's off the table. Okay. It was uh, really a factor because the U.S. grain industry had done a good job of convincing them to have the mandate, and they never could get the infrastructure built up to do it, and so they abandoned it about a year ago. Okay. So the mandate doesn't exist. They still have an ethanol industry. It is not doing very well right now. Their margins are poor, which is probably why China is not buying ethanol and not removing the anti-dumping duties on U.S. distillers' grains um, is to try to protect what industry there is. But the mandate is gone. If they had it, we'd have a huge market. But we see no interest in China right now and uh, mandating uh, blending levels that would support biofuels. One piece of audience feedback I often get from Canadian farmers, you know, one ag policy issue that in the U.S. the Canadian farmers I think are following really closely is, what is the future of the RFS? And if we don't have that kind of legislation in place to, to really use up, you know, what is it, about 40% of the U.S. corn crop? 
Um, what does that mean for the overall commodity cl- complex for, for other crops that, of course, w- we're mainly growing here in, in Canada? What, what is the future of, RF- of the RFS? Yeah, and it's, it was 40%. It's fallen back a little bit. And then, of course, the industry would want me to say, well, their distiller's grain still go into livestock. So that, <clears throat> that offsets some of it. So how you do the math. But um, the RFS, I think, also is going to struggle longer term. We're just not seeing the political support for it. Um, and, and that was illustrated when President Trump came into office. The farmers helped elect him in, said he supported ethanol. And uh, then he quickly allowed his uh, Environmental Protection Agency to give all of these waivers that dramatically reduced the demand for ethanol. And so then he tried to respond to it. But But frankly, there's a lot of political opposition right now to the biofuels because there's a perception that putting corn into ethanol is putting food into ethanol, going to leave us short on food, and that it's causing the rainforest to be destroyed. That doesn't hold up. The data doesn't support that at all. But that's the perception. And I, I remember a conversation with someone at a high level in the ethanol industry who was under the previous administration sitting with the director of the EPA in a meeting, a small group meeting, and uh, saying, so what's your opposition to ethanol? Well, it's that you're using food for ethanol. He said, okay, so if I have one acre of Iowa farmland that is growing corn, and that corn is used to produce ethanol. And out of that, we also get corn oil, which can go into food processes. And we get distillers grains that go into growing livestock for meat production to feed people. That is worse than growing one acre of switchgrass that goes to ethanol, but no food comes out of it. And she goes, yes. Huh. Um, so it's deeply ingrained within the well, as we often talk about the deep state here in the United States, <laughs> uh, the life staffers uh, within the bureaucracy of government to, who develop the policies and everything. And there's not many friends of biofuels left unless it can be something that is really outside of traditional production agriculture as we know it today. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of challenges. Uh, you, you brought up beef. Uh, maybe let's go there. Uh, I, there's something that doesn't add up for me, Arlen. I'm hearing about uh, strong beef demand uh, from some analysts through the summer into the fall, even with COVID happening. Uh, people clearly are showing their, their love of, of products or proteins like beef. Yet, when, when I see some of the drops in the food service sector, we saw McDonald's earnings yesterday, very poor, uh, con, you know, considering what some of the analysts were thinking. These things don't add up to me. What, what is your thoughts on beef demand? Well, actually, if you look at the McDonald's, and I'm going to disagree with you, and then I'm going to agree with you. Um, if you. If you look at the McDonald's data that came out yesterday, it was really encouraging for the beef industry um, on where they're coming back and really projecting that in the next year they may exceed pre-coronavirus levels for beef consumption. But we don't think that that is very indicative. This is where I'm going to agree with you. The rest of the restaurant and food service data would suggest that that's more of an aberration. That's not the norm. And overall, we're really missing that. So grocery store sales are obviously up double digits, but food service and restaurant demand is down by about 10 points more than what grocery demand is up. And we're not filling that. And right now we've got a backlog of beef. We can certainly see it in our uh, cold storage reports. The freezers are starting to fill up. We have seen as choice cuts got down to around $200, uh, we have seen consumer respond to that as the grocery stores have started to pass along the cheaper prices that has helped demand. Uh, We've seen export demand start to pick up as prices have come back down as well. Uh, But it's a very fine line right now and bordering on oversupply. And of course, we're going to be working through the backlog of beef from the processor shutdowns this spring, probably the rest of the year. Um, Hogs, the demand has been better, largely because of Chinese purchases, um, offsetting a lot of the domestic demand we lost. But 
we're getting a lot of congestion at the port in China, starting to back things up because of all the testing they're requiring for coronavirus. They've done hundreds of thousands of tests for coronavirus on imported meat. They've got a handful of positive tests on seafood, um, but yet they're still requiring it, and it is literally really backing things up at the ports, and eventually I think that's going to slow our exports. I, I heard from somebody that right now the ports in China are slower than they were when China was really dealing with COVID because of all the inspections that are going on. Um, the, the data I've seen would not support that. Okay. It's getting close. Um, when the COVID was really shutting everything down, all their reefer plugs or they plug in their refrigerator containers were all full and they were diverting shipments. We're not quite at that point based on the data I've seen this week, but we're getting close. Okay. Okay. Because we have a we have a packing plant here. Uh, the Cargill plant in High River is one of those plants that is on that list that cannot ship to China because they want them to prove... Uh, their product is COVID free. So, and th th it's ma many countries. It's just not a Canada US yeah. thing. There's the country or uh, packers from Argentina and Brazil on those lists, Australia, Germany. Yeah. Is it a non tariff barrier? Is, or what, what's, what are they doing? What, what are the Chinese up to? Well, it literally is a non tariff barrier, but this just shows the paranoia of coronavirus that China has for a virus that started in their country. Mm. And they are just, totally paranoid of this virus if they get one person in a in a region that's positive it's shut down that region shut down that city um they are just absolute shutdown uh, versus here we're obviously trying to find that balance what we can tolerate and still keep our economy going uh, but over there i guess you know you just print more money and do what you have to in a government controlled economy yeah, very, very true. Hey, Aaron, this has been a lot of fun. If somebody wants more information from Stonex, I've got the banner at the below. I uh, can talk to Jason or Megan. How else can people get a hold of Stonex? Yeah, you mentioned Megan. She's got quite a Twitter following, too, uh, FCS underscore our bell. Um, she uh, would love to have people follow her there. Um, but, yeah, Stonex.com uh, or over on Twitter. You can always follow me. I know I have a, a lot of followers in Canada from when I've come up there to speak. And uh, that's at uh, uh, Arlen, A-R-L-A-N-F-F-101. Yeah, you're, you're like way up there. Are you not like 40,000 followers or something like that? Well, you're a little too generous there, 31,000. Okay, well, you're doing <laughs> way more than me. You're doing, you're doing good. Hey, Arlen, I really, really appreciate you joining us here today. All the best to StoneX and your activities in the U.S. and, uh, of course, in Canada as well. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Okay, uh, if you have any follow-up questions for, for Arlen or anybody from the Stonex team, do not hesitate uh, to get a hold of them. I know that they would, would love to talk to you. Tomorrow on Real Ag Radio, or sorry, on <laughs> too many shows, on Real Ag Live tomorrow, we're going to reminisce. That's right. It is eight years on August 1st since the Canadian Wheat Board had their single desk monopoly lifted. And we're going to reminisce with a former Canadian Wheat Board Board of Director, Jeff Nielsen, who is currently president of the Grain Growers of Canada. We're going to kind of go back in time and talk about the single desk and what's good, what's bad. I know which side of the list I think is longer. Uh, hey, we're going to have some fun with it for sure. And actually, Jeff and I are going to tell a story about how real egg actually played a part while Jeff was a board member and him getting actually in trouble uh, on that board. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow. So, hey, I really appreciate everybody. If you want to get a hold of me, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com, or you can call that Real Ag Lister line, 855-776-6147. Thanks a lot for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag, Real Ag Live, and we'll talk again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody.